Today we're going to continue a four-week series that Tim started last week. Uh, it's called Back to the Basics. It's a series about going back to the basics, foundations of our faith. Um, this week, I changed shifts at work, uh, working on gold shift now. Fire department is broken up into three shifts. Everybody works a 24-hour shift, and then they get 48 hours off. So I'm working with all new guys this year. But I already know basically what to expect. Uh, my new lieutenant is got muscles on top of muscles, works out all the time. Um, so guess what I've got to do? I've got to get back to the basics, right? Well, we got another new kid on the shift, and uh, it, was, it was pretty funny because knowing full well that I don't have the stamina to, stamina to keep up with, with these guys, well, apparently he's not as bright as some because uh, he just jumped right in there and almost died. Uh, he gave it his all, gave it his best. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you're getting ready for a funeral after you get done working out, that's not, not really the, uh, the best way to do it, right? But, but we're getting back to the basics. So full well knowing that I need to do better, right? I'm... I could get in way better shape, and although round is a shape, um, but but getting back into shape, and and I know that I've got this guy that works out like two and three times a day, and I know I'm not going to be able to keep up with that guy, and so so I get my little basic thing, and I'm going to start working into this. Well, this guy just jumps into it, man, and it was hilarious because he was like, <sighs> I'm like, dude. What is wrong with you? But you gotta you gotta start at the basic, right? You can't like and just the exact same thing with getting back into the faith. And just like Pastor Tim started last week, we started with uh, with prayer. And prayer is a good one to start with because if you believe in God, all you have to do is speak or think or write or sing. There's multiple ways to pray. There's multiple ways to speak to God. And exactly, it's not that hard to pick up the Bible either. And when you pick up Scripture and you want to start reading, but buddy, if you could go right into it full-fledged and you just dive off into the deep end and you don't swim very well, you might not make it. So you got to just you got to take a little bit at a time, right? Just a little dab. A little dab will do you. And you'll build into it. And it's stamina. We're going to get into this, right? So... We need to build up that stamina to make these habits stick. Obviously, um, our journey continues uh, today with the Word of God and the Holy Scriptures. It may seem uh, like such an oblivious, important part of Christian faith, and yet for some reason, the Bible is all too often the overlooked portion or the ignored portion uh, in the Christian life. Simple truth is that the Bible is not unimportant at all. Uh, as we will learn today, the Word of God is living, active, profitable, profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and also in training. And that's just scratching the surface. The Bible is full of wisdom and full of surprises. Pick it up and try it for yourself. You'll find out real quick. Let's look at the very, very, very basics of the Bible. How many books are in the Bible? 66. They're broken up, the Bible is broken up into two sections, Old and New. The Old Testament uh, was before Jesus. The New Testament it covers Jesus' life uh, and then the years following, uh, approximately 70 years uh, in that time frame. The Old Testament consists of how many books? 39. Uh, divided into five sections. Five, first five books are called the Pentateuch. The next 12 books is called Old Testament History. Next five books will be called Old Testament Poetry. Then five major prophets and 12 minor prophets. If my math is correct, you should be at 39 there. New Testament consists of 27 books, also divided into five sections. The first uh, four books are called the Gospels. Then we have the Acts of the Apostles. That's just one book there. Uh, Paul's Epistles and also Hebrews. Uh, because we're not sure who wrote that one. 
the general epistles, well, that will be Peter, uh, John, James, and Jude. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then Revelation, one book. The Old Testament was written mainly in Hebrews, uh, also two books written, uh, original text in Aramaic, uh, that would be Ezra and Daniel. The New Testament was written in Greek. Longest book of the Bible is Jeremiah, even though you're saying that's not right, but it is. It's just that Psalms has more books of the Bible, or I'm sorry, more chapters of the Bible. Um... What else I got in here? The, the Bible has been translated into around 700 different languages, and there are entire ministries, uh, including Wycliffe Bible translators, that are continuing to translate, trying to be able to translate into every single language so everybody will have the ability to have the God's spoken word in their hands. The Bible is the all-time best-selling book, and over 100 million copies each year are sold. It's also the most stolen book. There's a lot of words in the King James Version, approximately just over 780,000, uh, 31,102 verses, 1,189 chapters. Everyone knows what the shortest book is, or I'm sure, sorry, the shortest verse is, and that is Jesus wept, Luke chapter 11. Shortest chapter is Psalm 117, longest chapter is Psalm 119, so not very far away, kind of interesting. Does anyone remember the pledge to the Bible back when you were a kid, or not even a kid? Everybody probably remembers it differently, um, so I'll see if I can remember, I should have wrote it down because I had it this morning. Pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, a lamp to my feet, light into my path. These words will I hide in my heart that I might not sin against God. Leading me to my next point, uh, that the Bible is good for memorization. Uh, Ken, could you tell me if we're a WANA student, if we go through the whole uh, process of WANA, approximately how many verses will we uh, commit to memory? Six and seven hundred different verses if we're in the Awana ministry, uh, committing verses to memory. The big idea is that this is a tool to equip and encourage us for kingdom living. Spending intentional time reading and meditating on the scriptures is daily sustenance that we need to continue to follow Christ. Let's pray. Lord, give us a hunger for the bread of life, the Word made flesh, your Scriptures. Give us space and time to meet with you in your Word every day. And Lord, help us to continue to make this a sustaining habit, that we will continue to be able to roll with this and not just make it happen for a little while. Lord, we love you and praise you. Thank you for everything. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you'll turn over to 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Verse 16 and 17 will be our main text today. And it says this, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Have you ever read the Bible and something just jumps out at you? Almost if, the, if it was just really just speaking to you, if it was written for that very moment. What about ever randomly opening a passage and just wondering what's here and you're able to receive sustenance at that time also? If you've ever felt those things, um, 
That's what you can find in Hebrews chapter 4. And the writers of Hebrews here describes those words of Scripture as both alive and active. So your first point is God's Word is living and active. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says for this, I'm sorry, this, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. To be alive in this sense means to be counted among the living and not of the dead. The point here that the writer of Hebrews is making is that each word of Scripture among the living and just as other human beings, animals, that it's all alive. And the word active also means that it's effective and productive in its work. So if you've actually opened up the word and you're like, Lord, speak, and it does, then that's the reason. For those of us in the room who have been reading the Bible for some time, I think uh, that we can all agree that the Bible is both living and effective. To drive that point home, the author of Hebrews says this, that the double-edged sword at dividing and cutting this through the soul and spirit, the word is powerful and able to get down to the heart of the matter. So again, if you've ever read the Bible and it seemed to spec- speak directly to the situation, I think it's fair to say that it probably was. As we grow in our faith, it's important to continue returning to the Scripture again and again. Because when it does speak to you in those instances, and you continue to come back to it, I mean, what part did you go through that specific time where, look how big it is. So if you were spoken to in one time or two times or three times when you needed it, look how much more is in there. Submitting ourselves to the Word of God and allowing the Spirit to work in and through our lives is what the Bible desires to do. I know that it may sound hokey or overly spiritual, um, but I tell you this, once you dig in, it's unquenchable. You'll, you'll want more. Try giving yourself a consistent time every day in Bible study and see for yourself just how powerful and profitable the Word is. God's Word is profitable. That's your second uh, step there. And I'm sure most of you uh, here today understand the idea of something that's being profitable. But this is more uh, than financial gain or win. This is speaking of what it can do for you for real. Interestingly, the word is also synonymous with the words beneficial and useful. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we just read that a second ago, we'll do it again. When the Apostle Paul is writing to the young pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy, uh, he tells him, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You may have noticed one verse says Scripture is useful, and the other says it's profitable. Good news is that the Bible is both. Add that to being living, active, or effective in its work. The Bible is also great for those things, for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. These are important words in the life of the disciple or the student. As we follow Jesus, we will submit ourselves to this process. His plan and His direction is also in our lives. Simply put, the Bible is profitable in the life of a disciple, and its profit is more than financial gain, it's spiritual gain. Following Jesus will cost you, but the value gained is inestimable. The theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said this, Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Sure grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. No. Last one here is Jesus is the Word. Listen to these words from John chapter 1. 
In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 1 clearly says that the Word was with God in the beginning, and that all things that were made were made through the Word. There is life in the Word, verse 4, and the Word is the light of mankind. Then the kicker in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among mankind. The Gospel of John goes on to explain that this Word is, in fact, Jesus. Actually, it couldn't be more clear than saying the Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word, and the Word is Jesus. Jesus spoke in metaphors uh, a lot of times. In these verses, he calls himself the Word and also the light. In John chapter 4, he calls himself the living water. In John chapter 7, he calls himself the living water again. In John chapter 6, he calls the bread of life. I'll go through there. In Matthew, he's the gate that the sheep go through. All of these things are just saying that he is God. He is with God. He was God. It's all together. John chapter 6, verse 46 through 51. And this passage um, is where he talks about being the bread of life. Starting verse 46, it says, Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the word is my flesh. It's essentially the same words that he says over in John chapter 4, except for in that time, he's talking about being the living water with the woman at the well. And then she shows up at the well to draw water in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, because she doesn't want anybody else to see her because of all of her troubles. And Jesus tells her that he's the living water and that he, if, if she wants to be quenched, if she wants to never have to draw water ever again, that she has to, to, be, to draw from his living water. But in John chapter 6, in this passage, and throughout the rest of the, the chapter, Jesus refers to himself as living bread or the bread of life. When Jesus was being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he says, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's Matthew 4.4. 4. Jesus knew that he didn't need another fresh, break, fresh, fresh baked loaf of bread from the bakery. What he needed, and what everybody needs, is the very word of God the true, living, breathing bread of life. There is other bread out there that may satisfy your earthly hungers, but nothing that will cure your spiritual starvation. Only Jesus can do that. And Jesus is the Word made flesh, the bread of life, and also the Scriptures. I believe it to be of utmost importance in the life of a believer to be in the Bible every single day. There's nothing like it. No other book has ever been written, and I can guarantee that there is not another book in in its existence that would say is alive and active. And yet I understand, too, that life gets complicated, and almost before you know it, your Bible reading plan is busted, right? Or that devotional thought you you bought... uh, to help you with some structure is nothing more than a permanent fixture on your mantle. So today, instead of another bullet point plan or a bunch of hooting and hollering, I'm just going to leave you with a few more words from Jesus. It's Matthew chapter 6. Many of you will be familiar with these words. This comes from the Lord's Prayer, and it simply says this, And give us, Lord, our daily bread. 
What if Jesus wasn't talking about French loaves and baguettes? What if he was talking about the bread of life? What if he was instructing the disciples to pray for him? And what if God gave us daily access to Christ through the Scriptures? Wouldn't that be an amazing way for God the Father to provide for all of his kids? So give it a try this week, but not just this week. Like we're saying, we're getting back to the basics. We're trying to establish good, godly habits. First one was prayer. Second is this, the reading of the Scriptures. And let's get the stamina built up so that we can stay in it and not just work out as hard as you can and then be completely exhausted and then not come back for another week or two weeks or ten months or however long it is. Let's build up that stamina together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for your word. And Father, we pray that you will just speak through that to us, into our lives, as we continue to try to do better. Lord, busy lives and things going on, and it's not always easy to keep up the good habits. Don't, don't always get rid of the bad habits, but it's not easy to keep up the good habits. And Lord, we pray that you will just speak to us in our prayers and in our scripture reading so that we can do better. Lord, we love you and praise you. Amen.